So good afternoon. My name is Diane Flayhart. I'm the global program leader uh, for the Antimicrobial Resistance Fighter Coalition. The coalition is a group of um, like-minded individuals, organizations from around the world that are sharing their stories and their efforts to combat AMR. Uh, what I'll do today is we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about what is antimicrobial resistance and how is it related to COVID. I think Christian did a great job in pulling that information together. And I'll share a little more thoughts around how I think um, there is definitely a linkage and perhaps um, an opportunity out of this unfortunate time in how we continue the conversation uh, around uh, infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship. We'll then move into some effective ways to communicate about AMR or antimicrobial resistance, and then end with some um, comments about the coalition, the work that we're doing, and uh, the efforts that we're leading to increase awareness of the issue. So to begin with, what is AMR? And there's many different terms for antimicrobial resistance. You'll hear things like superbugs or antibiotic resistance or drug resistant infections or antibiotic tolerance. So one of the challenging parts around antimicrobial resistance is not just that there are several different organisms that cause the problem, but we actually have many different names for the problem as well. So um, it makes it kind of a complicated message and story to share with others. But the bottom line is antibiotic resistance is when a germ, and that germ can be a bacteria, a fungus, um, develop the ability to defeat the antibiotic that's been designed to kill them. Meaning that if you have an infection with a bacteria, let's say you've cut your finger and you have an um, infection, you go and you take perhaps um, clindamycin, um, that bacteria is no longer going to react to that antibiotic and the, the infection will continue. And what's most scary is we know that many bacteria, much like we're learning about viruses, is that they're very smart and they adapt. And so you put one antibiotic against them and they'll adapt and become resistant to that antibiotic and then they will look for another antibiotic to be um, to try, and then that they also then will react to that antibiotic and become resistant to that one. So back in the fall, um, a fabulous updated report was released by the CDC, and I know we were talking a lot um, when Christian was speaking about um, surveillance and understanding the rates of the different organisms that are causing. Uh, problems. And I think this report has done a fabulous job in capturing a lot of current updated information. And they, uh, what they found was they went and they looked across um, the United States. So it is a limited U.S. to the U.S. They looked across the United States, pulled you know, thousands of data points to uh, determine what are the bugs that are causing the biggest threat and the ones that are causing the serious threat. And overall, what the CDC data showed is that the burden of antibiotic resistant threats um, has, uh, is greater than what we initially thought. So there's more drug resistance than we expected. However, the number of deaths have decreased since 2013 when they had done this, their previous report. So I think there's good news there that we are preventing infections. We're stopping the spread of antibiotic resistant organisms. However, um, uh, work, more work still needs to be done. Um, and in fact, we know that right now in the U.S., there's more than 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections occurring each year, of which 35,000 people die of those infections. And then speaking specifically to C. difficile, uh, the data they found was that um, there were nearly 223,000 uh, people requiring hospital care for a C. diff infection, and um, at least 12,800 people died of that disease in 2017. So I would urge you, um, if you haven't looked at this report, go to the CDC website. They have um, details on all the different organisms that are related to antibiotic resistance. And in fact, um, I think mean, the document's about 100 plus pages long, so very, very useful. 
And there is the question about, well, why should we care about AMR? What is the risk? And I think probably the audience that we have you know, here today at the, at the meeting probably understands this. But um, you know, we always need to step back and remind people that there's a cost to having resistant bacteria. Uh, there's obviously the human toll impact of um, having organisms that no longer respond to the antibiotics we have available. And the projections are quite you know, startling. When we think about um, in the future by 2050, having um, a projection of 10 million deaths and more than a you know, trillion dollars per year spent to combat these resistant bacteria, it really makes us step back and realize that much like COVID has made us step back, that this is a small world um, and we um, you know, take the, need to take the responsibility globally in how to combat this, this threat. So on the next slide, I'm going to share a little bit about why AMR is, occurs and what can we do to be uh, better prepared um, to combat this. So first we know that the overuse of antibiotics in human health is one of the causes of AMR. So you can see in the upper left-hand side, the picture here of us taking our medications. Um, in the U.S., over um, half the hospitalized patients in the U.S. receive an antibiotic. And a third of those are believed to be unnecessary or inappropriate. So we don't need those antibiotics. The other thing we tend to do when we take our antibiotics is we may not always finish the full prescription. So um, we've, we're always told, make sure you finish your full prescription. And if you don't, um, what happens is you may kill off many of the bacteria, but not all of them. And the ones that are left, you now expose to the antibiotic. So it's actually able to gain and build resistance. So the next time you want to use antibiotic, it will no longer be effective. Um, however, there's other drivers to AMR, not just the human side. As you can see here, um, about 70% of antibiotic use is for food production. So it's not the humans that are taking the antibiotics, but it's actually going to our food production. So um, whether that be for growth promoters, for chickens, pigs, other animals, um, you're actually getting antibiotics through the food chain. We also see that when animals who are receiving those antibiotics are, are out in the world, um, they can then, through uh, their waste, move antibiotics into the environment. And then once the antibiotics get into the soil, they then can be either absorbed you know, into our plants that we're, uh, and vegetables that we're going to eat, um, or sometimes we actually spray antibiotics directly on vegetables and fruits as growth promoters. So we're inadvertently ingesting antibiotics. And the fourth way that we are being exposed to antibiotics um, unintentionally is through um, our water systems. So there's been many, much research done showing that antibiotics are entering our rivers at a very high rate. There was a, a study done by researchers in Helsinki who went out and tested rivers across six continents and found 14 different antibiotics in the rivers of 17, uh, 72 countries. So pretty dramatic though, that these antibiotics are entering our water systems. Um, in fact, I think when they did a study uh, in India, they found that the number of bacteria in the river Ganges um, were actually highly resistant because of the antibiotics that were actually entering into the river and then the bacteria were being exposed to those antibiotics. So AMR is coming from all sides. And what we need to think about and why that's a risk is it can impact many things, right? It can impact uh, how we can have surgeries. If you think about prophylaxis and being able to get the right antibiotics. If you think about um, having chemotherapy, and as an immunocompromised patient, you need to have antibiotics available to you so that you can get treatment if you become ill. Even basic things like childbirth, not that having a child's basic after having two of my own, but a routine procedure like childbirth or by like having dental care can be put at risk if you don't have antibiotics available uh, when needed during those procedures. 
And so what can we do about this? When we think about antimicrobial resistance, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is antibiotics. We need more antibiotics. And that's definitely true that we need uh, new antibiotics to be developed. And there's actually several organizations, both here in the US and globally, funding and helping drive antibiotic development. But we know it's a timely process as well as a costly process to get this done. So we um, have to wait. And while we're waiting, we get this many actions we can take. And what I think you, what I find most interesting is many of these actions are actually the same actions that we've been talking about in the COVID-19 pandemic. The first one is around hand hygiene and infection prevention. So what can we do to um, prevent infection? And hospitals can improve that uh, for patients within their healthcare system when you think about healthcare associated infections. So we have better prevention, we can reduce the risk of those infections. Uh, if we have fewer infections, then there's less need for treatment so that you're using less antibiotics, as well as um, vaccination is critical in stopping uh, the effect, lowering the infection rate. The second key strategy that we can think about, I mean, think about an AMR and, you know, it's been an amazing conversation. I think that we've seen in the COVID conversation is that around diagnostic testing and the critical need to have diagnostic tests done to understand what antibiotic you need or perhaps don't need. So many patients receive an antibiotic without getting a microbiology test done. And if that test had been done, they may not have needed that antibiotic. So um, by not taking antibiotics when not needed, by getting your diagnostic test that tells you you have a viral infection is critical for combating AMR. And then lastly, it's around surveillance data and reporting. And we talked about this as well, where the more data we have, we can understand where the outbreaks are occurring and we can better fight and combat those, um, those outbreaks. So moving to COVID, let's think a little bit about COVID and how that relates to what we just talked about and how antimicrobial resistance is being developed and being managed. When we think of COVID, uh, it's a little different because it's a fast spreading pandemic. Um, however, it's challenging the capacity of our healthcare systems and it has the potential to overwhelm our hospitals. And I think we've seen around the world different areas of hotspots where it has overwhelmed our healthcare system. And the WHO put forth uh, critical preparedness actions that need to take place for managing uh, and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what you see here is many of these are very similar to what we're doing for AMR. When we talk about surveillance, infection prevention and control, laboratory testing, all these are things that we should be also be doing to combat AMR. The other thing that we need to do is mobilize across all sectors to combat COVID-19. And the same thing is true for antimicrobial resistance. We need all sectors, whether it's the public sector, the government, our public health agencies helping to combat COVID, uh, the private sector bringing on resources and technologies as quickly as possible, the non-for-profit sector bringing relief agencies on board, helping people get what they need, and civil society jumping in and really you know, helping those of us being impacted around the world. This is exactly the same grid that you will see for AMR as you see for COVID. And when you look at the AMR Global Action Plan that's been mobilized by the UN Interagency Coordinating Group, uh, and you look at the map there on the slide, you can see that most countries around the world have a global action plan in place on how they're combating AMR within their country. And these are the areas where they focus. So they want to focus on improving awareness, strengthening evidence, reducing infection, optimizing the use of antibiotics through diagnostic testing and increasing investments. These three pillars here that are marked urgent are critical to COVID-19 as they are to AMR. And it really shows the, um, the synergy of how the AMR uh, challenge that we've been facing over several years is really coming to light when you have a more uh, 
agile, aggressive pathogen like COVID-19. The good news is that I think that there's many tools that exist that can be repurposed to combat COVID-19 from either the stewardship or AMR space. Um, Shay just recently launched a, a fabulous program called Prevention Check. Uh, you can, uh, if you actually use your phone, you can scan either of these QR codes and it will take you to the website. And this um, talks about the prevention of clapsy, caldy, so catheter line infections, uh, urinary tract infections related to catheters. It also talks about prevention of C. difficile and meth-resistant staph aureus. But the strategies talk about the same infection prevention methods you need to use for COVID-19 as you'll be using to combat hospital-acquired infections. Also, the London School of Public Health and Hygiene has a, um, a MOOC, which is a massive online open course that you can uh, learn about AMR. Uh, they've actually just recently launched one uh, a couple of weeks ago on COVID-19. That's, that's fabulous. And to summarize, when I think about how AMR and COVID-19 are kind of intersecting, there's also the very you know, real space that, that many of our patients that are being impacted by COVID-19 are entering into the critical care locations of our, our, our hospitals. And that's also where they have a higher risk for acquiring some of the hospital acquired infections, whether that be the clopsies, the catheter associated urinary tract infections, or even C. diff, because many you know, secondary infections are occurring. I, I think there was one report that I recently read that upwards of 50 to 70% of patients who have COVID-19 also have a secondary bacterial infection. Imagine if that was a resistant infection, how much harder it'd be to manage. So with that, I'm gonna take a break from talking uh, and we're gonna do a poll. So let's see here um, if you guys are able to look at the poll. Okay, so let's go to, mm, that's lots of different questions here. But let's go to the one, if you can see this one here that says, Due to COVID-19, I'm going to turn my, my uh, camera on. There we go. So um, there's one there that's posted that says, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think that individuals will now have a better understanding of the risk of AMR? And what that poll was, question is meant to ask is we've been now exposed to things like surveillance, to diagnostic testing, all these important critical things that we need to know about COVID-19, as well as we've been you know, told on how to best wash our hands, infection prevention. Do we, you know, do we think there's opportunity that people can now learn from this and will now understand how to combat AMR? So that's what that poll question's about. And then I believe we also have another poll question um, that is, what behaviors do you think individuals will continue after the pandemic. And this is something I've talked to a lot of people about. Um, right now, we do believe that people are oversaturated. It's hard for us to talk about AMR when we're talking about COVID, but and you know, what do you think that they'll take away from that? What behaviors do you think they may uh, start to ask their physicians, think about when they go, um, when they think they have an infection? Well, they maybe you know, recognize the importance of vaccination, the importance of hand washing, ask for a diagnostic test, that maybe they had never thought to do before. So feel free to go to those polls, answer those questions, um, and that will be fine. And maybe at the end, we will um, go back to that. And now we're gonna go back to the screen and uh, get to our second section. Okay. So the next part of our presentation is really gonna talk about what are the most effective ways to communicate about antimicrobial resistance. And as I said in the beginning, um, talking about AMR can be tricky because we have lots of terms for it. It uh, tends to be a little scientific. Uh, we tend to get into um, either jargon or things that people don't understand. So Welcome Trust put together a fabulous uh, report uh, that they published 
um, that is a new toolkit that talks about how to effectively communicate on antimicrobial resistance. And what they did was they did research across seven countries, um, incorporating extensive um, research in what is being said in the media, what is being said in social media, doing interviews with experts and doing um, qualitative and quantitative testing. And uh, I included the link here that you can go um, and actually get to the report. But the, the one key slide that I think was very impactful was they laid out the five framing recommendations of the key principles for communicating around antimicrobial resistance. And these were things that help people understand the issue more effectively. And the first one is frame drug resistant infections as undermining modern medicine. So what that means, it's hard for people to understand why they should care about antimicrobial resistance and the risk of overusing antibiotics. However, if we frame that in discussion about common infections and injuries that were once easily treatable or things like common healthcare um, procedures like dental care and childbirth could be put at risk, help people relate what these resistant bacteria could impact. The second is to help um, understand the fundamentals succinctly, um, making sure that people realize that there is their behavior is um, fueling the risk of, uh, or the threat of AMR. So helping the public understand that resistance is happening in the bacteria, not in themselves, and that their behaviors that they change can have a direct impact in reducing those resistance rates. The next one is emphasize that this is a universal issue. It can affect anyone, including yourself. And this is important because what they found in their data is when you um, start to say, this could only impact um, the elderly population or other populations, people tend to think, oh, well, that's not me. So I, should, I, I don't need to do something different. And if anything, I think we've learned that in COVID-19, right? Where we know that um, this really, you know, these sort of bad bugs can affect anyone, especially in yourself, if you don't uh, change your behaviors. The other uh, fourth one is focus on the here and now. And why that's important is for a long time, when we talked about antimicrobial resistance, we would show that stat that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, that in 2050, we'll have all these bad, you know, bad costs, high deaths, deaths higher than cancer. But the challenge of that is when you talk about those sort of um, apocalyptic impacts that happen 20, you know, 30 years from now, it's very hard for people to put their head around what they should be doing now. So really talking about the here and now, what we can do um, versus showing the future uh, makes it much more actionable that people need to say today, I need to do something different. And then the last one gets to that immediate action, making sure that people understand there's a solvable thing that they can do that they themselves and have a specific clear call to action. I think um, these are very basic things, but I think as all of us are out talking to organizations, individuals, policymakers about antimicrobial resistance and C. diff, uh, we sometimes get into our own headspace where we think about this every day and we forget that not everyone else does. So making sure that we are going back and reflecting upon how to talk about these challenges will help us better then inform the public and we can have more impact. So there's uh, two poll questions uh, related to this uh, topic. And the first one is, is an easy yes or no answer. Do you think that we overuse scientific jargon when communicating about C. diff and AMR? Um, so you can just answer yes or no. And then the second poll question is, can you share an example of when you successfully communicated to the public about C. diff and AMR? Uh, we'll collect all the responses and send these out to participants to uh, share uh, best practices, because you guys have all done great work and it's always, I always find sharing uh, success, we can all do better at our goals of improving communication. And then our last objective of this session is how does the Antimicrobial Resistance Fighter Coalition drive awareness and encourage others to take personal responsibility? So many of you may be familiar with the coalition. 
The coalition is made up from supporters from around the world. We currently have supporters, uh, I think we're at 46 different countries from around the world that share their stories about the work they're doing to combat AMR. The aim is that others read these stories and then they themselves will also take personal responsibility for combating AMR and reducing antibiotic use. We focus on three different groups and you can see there on the left, many um, of the folks here on the phone today who um, make up our patient advocacy groups. So we have patient advocates uh, in the C. diff space as well as other patients who've been impacted by multi-drug resistant infections. We work with organizations from around the world. Uh, this example here is from Shea, but we also highlight other organizations, whether they're microbiologists, microbiologists, infection preventionists, antibiotic stewardship, uh, researchers. Uh, we recently had a group join us from Australia. They are creating uh, probiotics for cows. So instead of giving antibiotics as growth promoters to cows, they're developing a probiotic to take uh, antibiotics out of the food chain, which is you know, unique and fabulous work. And then lastly, we have global uh, leaders, both in government and non-government organizations. Uh, that's Dame Sally Davies that you see there, who um, leads the uh, AMR on envoy for the UK. Uh, so she has been in the forefront of raising awareness of AMR since this came to the UN back in 2017. And what we look to do uh, with the Antimicrobial Resistance Fighter Coalition is to really amplify uh, these messages and we do that via our website as well as on social channels. So our website, uh, we launched about, um, it's, it's been about eight months now our website has been built to share critical information about what's happening in the space, share the messages of our supporters, recognize all the different organizations that we're partnering with. And then we have both learn pages and take action pages where we share with people uh, different articles, uh, both uh, basic articles as well as detailed scientific articles about what to do about AMR. And then we also highlight different events that um, could be occurring. Of course, right now, um, all events are on hold, but when we do go back to having events in person, we certainly will be sharing um, and going to events to share information about um, the coalition and the supporters and the great work that they're doing. Um, if you hold up your phone, uh, you can actually scan this QR code and it'll take you directly to our website. We also um, share uh, lots of content on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and um, you can see here we do different things. We try to highlight important awareness weeks. We share articles that we think are relevant and uh, important to read from an awareness perspective. We highlight the efforts that different uh, our different partners are doing. And then we also share um, this critical information about antibiotics, when to use them, how to use them. Uh, we recently over the past month have refocused our efforts into really around infection prevention, because we have to be aware that right now we need to recognize people need to think about COVID-19 as our, you know, our critical uh, global issue. And uh, then we'll transition back to talking more about superbugs and antibiotics. One of the things that we found quite exciting is our YouTube channel um, has been very well received. We have right now probably about 25 videos up. So I encourage you to um, go there and listen directly from the supporters and the work they're doing. And we have you know, several thousand views now of our videos. Uh, the last thing we like to do is host events. Uh, this was an event that we co-hosted with the CDC Welcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ASM, back uh, last year during United Nations General Assembly Week, where we worked with artists around the world to bring their art to uh, the event. So you can see here is art that microbiologists created on auger plates. 
Here are uh, some cartoon um, designers, one from Singapore, one from the UK that created cartoons talking about antibiotic resistance. We, um, I don't think we have that, the other one. We, uh, then here are some other ones that you can see where we had artists who actually created a quilt out of um, meth resistant staph aureus. And then this is actually a picture of the amount of pills taken every year on an annual basis that were taken um, and that were not needed to really show the grand scope of how many antibiotics we take every day that we don't need. We also um, highlighted a um, documentary on AMR. Um, and here, you, this is the documentary uh, creator and Dean Sally, um, a leader from Welcome Trust. And this is David Ritchie, a patient who had been impacted by a multi-drug resistant infection talking about uh, antimicrobial resistance. So the Antimicrobial Resistance Fighter Coalition, we're trying to um, elevate awareness and do that through different communication channels that can help everyone understand what we need to do to change our behaviors. So um, these are the poll questions for this section. So I assume that they're probably posted up now. We can, we can check. So here I'm back in. Um, I'm looking here in the poll area. So this, if you scroll through, you should be able to find these other questions. Um, one is about, are you an antimicrobial resistance fighter? And by being on this call, um, in this meeting, I'm sure that all of you are, um, but you can answer that to your uh, ever way. And if you'd like to share your story about how you're combating C. different AMR, send me more details. I'd love to talk to you, help amplify what you're doing, uh, whether that uh, be creating a message, increasing our uh, social impact, as well as um, going into um, different print media as well to make sure that the message is being shared. So thank you all for your time. Hopefully I uh, kept this a little interesting. I know it's hard for us to interact over the, um, the computer and look forward to maybe seeing you next year in person. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Hey, Christian. Hey, Debbie. How are you? Hey, Ellen, I just heard, I just logged on, so I didn't hear what Diane had stated about finishing antibiotics, but maybe I could answer that for you. What was your question about that? Well, I'm a nurse, so it's in my DNA to tell people to finish their course of antibiotics, but I thought she said something about not finishing them. I, okay. That's why I'm asking. I wasn't yeah. sure. And she might have, and I can um, help clarify. So I did not hear what she said, but in general, um, physicians have traditionally prescribed antibiotics in courses of seven, 10, 14 day increments. And those are football scores. We feel like those numbers were just um, pulled out of the air many years ago. And it's been the traditional duration of therapy. There have been several new studies showing we can give far fewer days of antibiotics. And for that reason, that prescription for 14 days may very well at this point for many documented clinical studies that are evidence-based, it is not appropriate any longer. And so if someone asked me in the management of a UTI, do I need this 14 days? My answer would be no, do not finish that antibiotic. So again, I don't know what Diane said, but I think that might be what she was referencing because um, I was not on yet, uh, that many of the durations of antibiotic courses are far too long. And every day you're on an unnecessary antibiotic, you increase your risk of C. diff. So for that reason, we want those traditional durations of therapy for many diseases, community acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections, skin and soft tissue infections. There is newer data that shows you do not need those long durations, but many, many physicians do not know that data and therefore they just stay with these very long durations. Mm. So how would a lay person know something like that though? That's where your pharmacist becomes very important in the discussion. Um, you know, these are things that the Infectious Disease uh, Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists have really been advocating. The Infectious Disease Society of America, um, which is a multidisciplinary group, it's primarily physicians, but nurses and pharmacists are also a part of that. 
I use Twitter to put that out um, on a regular basis to try to educate people globally. These durations of therapy are no longer necessary for all types of infections. There are still some, such as osteomyelitis, Mm -hmm, where you need mm -hmm. longer durations. But even osteomyelitis now has a new study. And we traditionally would go at least six weeks. Um, Endocarditis. The, you know, now there's a study saying you can give oral therapy for much shorter durations. That's new data. And in many physicians defense, if you're a family practice doc, just trying to stay up with vaccination and all that, you can't be on top of all this literature. That's our job as an antibiotic steward is to make that information readily available. And one of the best places you'll find is on Twitter an ID physician from California, Brad Spellberg, has published data in JAMA on shortening durations of therapy, but he creates a table with the old school traditional durations and then the new evidence-based. So it's not just opinion. You can give this for five days. It's evidence-based and he has references. And if you go on Twitter and look him up, you will find his table and it's constantly being updated as new studies are published. It's the best way um, to try to advocate shorter courses of therapy, and it directly ties to the rates of C. diff. So it's a very important message to have. Oh, so I see Diane is back. So that, that was my question, Diane, about finishing, Hi, Diane. finishing a course of antibiotics. Oh, I don't hear her. I can't hear her. Diane, are you muted? Hear- Yeah. So now I'm back in person, and thanks to you. Okay. But I was saying thank you, Debbie, for jumping in there. But I um, it's just the expert here because she's the one that uh, you would want to listen to. So I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's one forty-five, and we're supposed to be going for a break. Uh, and yep. Our phones from CDC are starting at two. Uh, there was one question here that I wondered if 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 any of you wanted to tackle it um, before we go, which is. Um, uh, a woman who I've been talking to for a while, Kimberly, has had a history of recurrent C. diff and she's been given multiple antibiotics for an infection. Um, that seems necessary from what I've heard from her. And she's wondering, like, is this is this dangerous? Like, what, what should she do? I mean, she really didn't have a choice. Right. And in the yes, hospital perspective? Yeah. Think- yeah, I think Debbie might be the... Yeah. So when you have an active infection that requires antibiotics, obviously you are at incredibly high risk for your C. diff to return because now you're on an antibiotic. Um, I think one of the uh, best ways to approach that is we would recommend prescribing the antibiotic with a probiotic. And the probiotic can help repopulate your gut flora while it's being Um, challenged with the antibiotic, and that's probably been the most uh, effective way, assuming she doesn't have an active cancer. You know, some of the probiotics, there are risks involved in giving it to patients. So if she's not a um, organ transplant patient or has active cancer underlying um, as a disease, uh, and there's a couple other caveats, then I would recommend a probiotic uh, during the course of antibiotic therapy. Do probiotics, can they interfere with your immune system? Is that why you mentioned cancer and stuff? Well, no, the probiotics are active bacteria. And oh. so then you put, you know, there's, yeah, there I gotcha. are some... Um, Patients that are immunocompromised, and when right. you're giving active bacteria, you know, you're giving I bacteria, gotcha. you. you can potentially, and there are case reports of patients acquiring um, a bacteria from the probiotic and okay. having uh, a very bad outcome, getting bacteremic. Right. It's not common, but those are patients I generally would not use a probiotic in for that reason. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I suspect people may need to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go run, and run my dog. Thank you, Diane. Um, I, I posted a little link, but please, everyone else, join us back at the main stage at 2 o'clock for Centers for Disease Control talking about how they're helping to make C. diff count.